Good evening. It's so good to see you all coming out here in-house and those who are online to join us for tonight's Bible study. I'm excited and I'm enjoying it. I hope you are too. So I'm not going to keep Pastor Lincoln waiting. I'm going to go ahead and open us up in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to gather together again in your house that we may be able to study your word. I pray that as we sit here in our seats and those online, as they prepare themselves, that they cry out right now and ask you to give them the wisdom to understand and the knowledge to be able to follow along in this book that sometimes can be a little complicated. But thank you, Father God, for Pastor Lincoln and how he gives it to us in such a way that we can understand it. And I pray that you just help him to remember everything that he has studied. And thank you for his clarity that he brings. I pray for those who are on their way that you give them traveling mercies. For it is in Jesus' most precious and holy name that I pray. Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much. Well, it's good to see you tonight. How many is ready for another session on the book of Revelation? Amen. <laughs> so we're going to pick up kind of where we left off last time, but I wanted to back up and just restate some things. I have found, I think this is the third or fourth time I've moved through this book, teaching this book, and each time I move through it, I learn so much more. And so I want to share some things with you that it took me four Bible classes to actually grasp it and, maybe, and, and give it to you so maybe you don't have to take as long. And it concerns the, uh, the timeline uh, within this book. And as you know, the high level is there are seven, uh, there are seven seals and there are, then there are seven trumps and there are seven vials or seven bowls of God's judgment. And the natural tendency is to read the book and try to put it in a linear timeline. And what I mean by a linear timeline is that we tend to say, okay, there's seven seals, and after the seventh seal, oh, we get to the first trumpet. And then there's seven trumpets, and at the seventh trumpet, now we get to the first bowl. And that's, we don't know exactly what the timeline is, but we do know it's not that. The book is not written in a linear manner. It's, the timeline is sometimes twisted, sometimes it doubles back over itself. And I think that uh, perhaps nobody knows the exact uh, sequence of events. You, you can go on the internet, you can follow ministries that uh, teach the book of Revelation, and you'll find no shortage of theories regarding what that timeline is. For example, this is a configuration that uh, is prominent. I'm, I'm not putting this up because I'm saying it's right. I'm just saying it's one of the many theories, which would be like the first three seal judgments. And then there's a couple of Trump judgments. And then the fourth and the fifth seal at the same time as the third and the fourth trumpet. At the same time, the first two bowls are being poured out. So my point is that uh, it's, it's not a linear timeline. It is a timeline that's very convoluted, and it's not important to know exactly when everything's going to happen. What's important is to know what's going to happen. If it were important to know the exact timeline, God would have told us the exact timeline. He didn't. He just wants us to know these things are going to come to pass. And so uh, if, if you, you, know, you believe what you believe concerning how things are going to happen— don't be dogmatic about it because you can't prove it. Somebody else has another scripture can say, no, this happens before that happens. But the point, that's not the point uh, of the book. The point is to reveal what is going to happen uh, and not the exact timeline that we're dealing with. Now, I bring that up because we're going to look uh, back up just a little bit and look at the sixth seal again. Uh, I touched on it last session, but I want to touch on it again because I think I maybe miss bringing out uh, clearly the enormity of the event. 
And so as we looked at the, the seals, the first seal was the white horse rider, the Antichrist, and followed by the red horse rider, which is war, the black horse rider, which is famine. And then the fourth horse rider was the pale horse rider, which was death. Uh, and the scripture says, and hell does follow, meaning that many of those people that die in those events of the first three horse riders ultimately will be consumed by hell. Then the fifth was uh, the souls of those who were under the altar in heaven, who had been martyred for the cause of Christ. And so tonight we're going to pick up then again with the sixth uh, seal. Let's see, I think I'm missing. Oh, yes, this is right. Uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, this word low is important. It's, it's synonymous with the word behold. It means stop and put all of your attention on this. This is a significant thing that's happening. It's not just the regular story like, oh, oh look at this. So John says, lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. Now, of course, when we're reading the English Bible, we're reading a translation. Someone took the original language and translated it uh, to English. And so when they took the original word, they said, well, earthquake is the best word to, uh, to, to relate what this uh, word is in the original language. The word earthquake actually, though, in the Greek, it means a commotion. It means a commotion. Uh, so that if this commotion were on the on the on the ground, on the earth, it would be an earthquake. If it were in the atmosphere, it would be a hurricane or a tornado or some type of a, a tempest like that. But it's, a, com it's a, a, a commotion. Now, this is maybe gives us a bad direction when it just says earthquake, because the description of what is going to happen is not an earthquake. It is a creation quake. God is going to rattle the entire universe. Now, because of these events and how they're happening, I cannot see the sixth seal happening in the first half of the tribulation period. This is when God lets all men know you are now dealing with an angry God, with the living God. He reveals himself to man, and uh, the scripture is, is shocking in terms of what it is telling us. Now, the, the rule of hermeneutics is that if you can interpret it literally, you should interpret it literally. And in this description that he gives of the sixth seal, there's no reason not to interpret it literally just the way that is written. And so he begins by saying the sun became uh, black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood, which means there's some type of atmospheric um, uh, anomaly going on. Perhaps uh, dust is kicked up in the air. Uh, because there's going to be quite a commotion uh, uh, on, on the earth itself. And so it blocks out the sun. Uh, the moon turns as blood. Many commentators think that, that as sun goes down, the dust in the air gives off a reddish hue. That may be right. That, that may not. I don't know. But we do know that John said the sun became as sackcloth of hair. That, it means that this, this is a global situation. Uh, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. So this is the commotion we're talking about. This lets you know it's not an earthquake because earthquakes don't cause the, the atmosphere. It doesn't cause rocks to fall out of the heaven. But God has shaken the entire galaxy. Even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now we have to go back and look at uh, what John's reference is what his knowledge base is. Uh, John would not know what a star is. We today know that a star is a massive ball of fire, many times bigger than the earth. John would not have known that. They didn't have that knowledge uh, of astrological events at that time. So what he would have seen perhaps is a meteor coming into the atmosphere. And when this happens, the friction of the atmosphere causes it to burst into a very hot ball of fire. And he would have seen what you and I may call a falling star. If you have ever seen a falling star just shriek through the heavens. Uh, except he says stars, plural, meaning that there's a lot of them falling. There's, there's multiples of them. 
And this lets us know that God is shaking not just the earth, he's shaking the heavens, and these meteors begin to hit the earth. Even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. And on top of that, the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and every island are moved out of its place. So this commotion, this creation quake, it causes many of the mountains to topple over. It causes many of the islands to move on the tectonic plates or to even go underwater. He shakes the entire earth. I mean, he's getting man's attention. Because it's so drastic what is happening, I just don't see it happening in the first half of the tribulation because this is more heavy-duty judgmental stuff that happens in the last uh, part of the tribulation period. So he says every mountain and island are moved out of their place. So this catches the attention of the entire planet. God is revealing himself. How many's ever been in an earthquake? Have you ever been in an earthquake? They're scary, aren't they? Because they're so unusual. It's like, what in the world is going on? You can't, it takes you a minute to figure out what, what is happening. Well, if you can imagine that happening to such an extent that mountain ranges move and that islands go under or new islands come up, uh, every island moved out of its place, uh, it will shock the entire world. But more important than that, that, the first phrase says, and the heavens departed like a scroll. Now, scripturally, there are three heavens. There's the first heaven, which is our atmosphere, which is transparent. You can see right through it anyway. I mean, I, I can see you because I'm looking through uh, the atmosphere. The second heaven is the thick black swaddling band that God has put. We call it the universe. That's the second heaven. And the third heaven is God's abode. That's where uh, God's throne is at. Well, this is talking about the universe. This is talking about where the stars abide. It says it departed like a scroll. Get that. And it, a scroll when it's rolled together. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. This lets us know that everyone on the planet is aware that this is very unusual what is happening. This is an event that strikes terror in the hearts of every person. And you'll notice the list. It starts with the kings of the earth. That's the presidents, prime ministers, the dictators, uh, rulers of countries. It goes on the great men and the rich men. These are the corporate uh, titans, the billionaires of the world. So it starts at the very highest, but then the chief captains, the mighty men, the bondmen, meaning slaves, and every free man, that sums up the totality of the inhabitants of the earth. They run to the rocks. They hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And they say to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? This lets us know that when the heavens depart like a scroll, they can correctly identify who has done this. It means that they feel the holiness of God burning, and they're saying, hide us from this one we see sitting on the throne, and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Now, that's a somewhat oxymoronic statement, the wrath of the Lamb. When we think of Jesus Christ, we think of a, 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 a man with a shepherd in his, a, a, a sheep in his hand, and he's, he's just full of love, and he's just blessing everybody. <laughs> but this says he's also a wrathful Lamb. So men are hiding, they're scattering, they're trying to run into caves, anything to block the view of him that sits upon the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. This means that God has just revealed himself to the human race. It means that he has just ripped open the outer space so you can look right up through the second heaven and see him in the third heaven sitting upon his throne. That's scary, isn't it? 
For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now, I want you to remember this question, who shall be able to stand? Because when we get into the seventh chapter, the seventh chapter really answers who is able to stand in the day of his wrath. But certainly by this point, which again, I just don't see this event as I've just described it happening in the first three and a half years of the tribulation, because this is more uh, the, the end of days. This is more the wrapping up uh, of, the, of the hour of man's sinfulness. So then chapter seven. Now we just talked about the sixth seal. There's one more seal for us to, to talk about. But in the middle of that, between seal six and seal seven, we have the seventh chapter, which is described by uh, some as being a parenthetical. It's a side issue. Uh, it's, it's, it's a side issue. It doesn't move the timeline forward or anything. It just gives us more revelation of what is occurring. So let, let me say this as well. Up until now, John has been describing events on the planet. Uh, the white horse rider, the Antichrist, that happens on the planet, the famines, the wars, uh, the death. Um, it, all of this is, is happening on the planet. Now he changes his view and he begins to look at events that are happening simultaneously in heaven. And so he's given us another view. He says, Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now, this term, the earth really doesn't have four corners. It's not flat. It's actually round. Uh, it's the idiom that's used. It just means the entirety of the earth. It's just an old Jewish idiom. He says, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. They're holding back the winds. Now, the winds being discussed here are the winds of God's wrath. God's wrath now has boiled over. He's ready to explode, but the four angels hold back the winds of God's wrath and for a purpose that will be seen in just a moment. It says they hold back the winds of the earth so that the wind should not blow on the earth, number one, the sea, number two, or any tree. Now, we'll see later on when these four angels have accomplished their task and they allow the judgments of God, the first thing that happens, he hits the earth, then he hits the sea, then he hits the trees. And so for just a moment until uh, the harvest of the 144,000 can occur, these angels are holding back the wrath of God. Verse 2, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. So there's another angel now, and he has what is described here as the seal of the living God. And he's crying to the four angels. He's saying, hold it back. Hold back the winds, hold back the winds of God's wrath because this angel has a job that must be done before the wrath of God falls uh, in, in a terrible way. And so if we look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1, I want to give an explanation of what this seal of the living God is. It's referred to a number of times in the scripture and it, it really just means salvation, blood-bought salvation. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That means every blood-bought Christian, not church person, but a person who's come through the blood has been saved by the blood. They have been sealed with the seal of the living God. And in our storyline in Revelation, he's about to touch 144,000 full-blooded Jewish people 
um, with salvation to be used uh, in, in this tribulation period. Again, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, it tells you and I, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So the seal of God is true blood-bought salvation, which exposes the inner man now to the working and operation of the Holy Spirit. That's what the seal of the living God is. In short, it is true salvation, not religion, true salvation, a Holy Ghost salvation. And so he had the seal of the living God. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, until, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. That means until we have caused uh, salvation to occur in the lives of those being sealed. Now, this, this word sealed, if you look it up in the original language, it speaks of an imprint. It, it carries the idea of being imprinted. Now, I don't think that means a physical imprint in our foreheads, or else you and I would have one <laughs> if you're saved. But I think it does. there is a imprinting on our mental faculties that God is now the first thing on the foreground of our minds, that we have an awareness of him that uh, unredeemed people do not have. So the angel cries out to, don't hurt the earth, the sea, or the trees till we've served, sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, this is interesting. <clears throat> 144,000 people are about to be saved. Not one single Gentile in the bunch. <laughs> These are all Jewish people. And in fact, there's 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes that multiply that out. That's 144,000. Now, most, most Jews now don't even know what tribe they came from. That's been long ago lost. The lineage has long ago for, for many of them, probably most of them. They're not really sure. They've intermingled. The tribes have intermingled and they just don't know what tribe is, is what tribe. But here's what's amazing. God has kept a record. He knows exactly these 12,000 come from this tribe. This 12,000 comes from this tribe. He has kept it down through the ages. He's kept track of that. And so now, in the end of days, it says of the tribe of Judah, there were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephilim were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Zebulon were sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Uh, incidentally, 12 is the number of government with God. It, it indicates government. But of all of these 12 tribes... He saves 12,000 people in, during the tribulation period because they are going to be the evangelists during the tribulation period, causing many people to turn their hearts to the Lord. And, and here's something I, I need to say this. When the sealed judgments start, people will still be getting saved. When the trumpets begin to blow, people will still be turning their heart, repenting, and turning to God. It's not until the bowl judgments pour out that anyone who had a mind that I'm going to go God's way has already gone God's way. So the thought is that the seal judgments, that's the kickoff of the tribulation. It's on. It's getting ready to happen. The trumpets, a trumpet generally is an alarm. You blow the trumpet, you sound an alarm to let people know, hey, this is happening. 
But then when people don't respond to the alarm, uh, then certainly God's anger, his wrath is filled uh, and it begins to fall. So we have this 144,000 Jewish, uh, Jewish people that are now saved and going to be used by God during the tribulation to evangelize not just Israel, but to evangelize the world. And they will, their lives will be under a supernatural protection that they cannot be hurt until their job is complete. Verse 9. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and psalms, palms in their hands. So as a result of the 144,000, their effort to evangelize the world, John now catches a glimpse of the end effect. I behold, this is a great multitude, which no man could number. That's how many people came to the Lord. A great number, and it's global. All nations, kindreds, peoples, and tongues. It's global all over the world. People are coming to the Lord as a result of the efforts, the supernatural efforts of this 144,000. They stood before the throne and before the lamb and they were clothed in white robes. And we know that the white robes are indicative of the uh, unsullied righteousness of Jesus Christ that's imputed to every Christian. Every blood-bought person is imputed. Uh, the, Christ's righteousness is put on their accounts is what imputed means. So we know that these then uh, are saved and, and palms in their hands. And I had to look this up, this palms in their hands, the idea here is that palms indicate uh, victory or joy or peace. And so it just means that they had an expression of, of the victory that Jesus had given to them. And this great multitude that we're talking about, they cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God who sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Now, if you will notice in all of this, it keeps mentioning the lamb, the lamb, the lamb. Never once does it say the son of God. He is the son of God, but he's not being at this time recognized as such. He's being recognized as the sin sacrifice for all those who would simply repent and come to Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing how easy it is? You just repent and you come to Jesus Christ. And God is so loving. Sometimes you can come to Jesus Christ first and he'll let you repent as you're coming. It's just you have to have your mind made up. And quite frankly, no matter how you come to Jesus Christ, you're repenting from that point forward. <laughs> over and over, there's always something different for you to be repenting about. But God is so good. They cried with a loud voice, salvation to our God which this phrase really means salvation is of our God. It doesn't mean they're attributing salvation to the Lord. He don't need to get saved. Uh, but it just means that salvation is of our God. It's his redemption plan. He paid for it. Uh, he paid the price for it. To our God which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. Now, you got to catch this picture of heaven. It's a large expanse, to be sure. It's a large place. You have God the Father sitting on the throne, and you have the Lamb, God the Son, standing before the throne. Somewhere there in an a ark, no doubt, is the four living ones that cease not day nor night, but to cry, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. There's a semicircle around them, which is the 24 elders, which represents the redeemed church of the living God, Old and New Testament. And then you have a myriad of angels standing somewhere looking on this, and now you have an innumerable number that no man can number of saints that have come out of the tribulation, and all of them fall before the throne on their faces and worship God. 
Now, I want you to pay attention to what these words are saying. It doesn't say they gave God a golf hand clap. It, it, it doesn't say they kind of, you know, just under their breath, just uh, kind of, you know, just kind of, you know, Lord, I love you. But, but they were very exuberant about it. They fell to the ground on their face in absolute worship of the Lord. Now, I say that for this reason. If it's difficult for you to worship the Lord, to express your worship, you're going to be very uncomfortable in heaven. You're going to be very uncomfortable. And, you know, uh, but I, I sympathize because when I first got saved, I, I, it was very hard for me to worship. And, and we were like, I was in a holiness church, and it was just difficult because it was pride. Pride. And it may, somebody might look at me. I didn't care if somebody looked at me when I was in the street. When I was on drugs, didn't care at all. But suddenly in the church, somebody might look at me. And we had a drummer in those days. And we, again, this was a holiness church. It was not nearly as sophisticated as we have here now. We, you know, we were tambourines and stomping on the wood floor. We was making church. And we had a drummer that the brother was always firing. And he could play very well, professional level drummer. And, the, and we were all just, we were just praising God. He gets up and without missing the beat, he started dancing. And he danced all the way around the drums, never missed a beat. That's how this guy was. And I'm sitting there in the aisle, I'm right in the aisle, I'm scared to death. <laughs> you know, and I, I want to praise God, but I, I was I was just inhibited by my own pride. And he starts dancing away from the drums and starts dancing down my aisle. And he grabbed my hand and pulled me up out of my chair. And the Spirit of God hit me, and for the first time, I was able to openly worship the Lord. It's a deliverance that's needed, and it's something all of us have to work on. Get outside of yourself. What the fall did to us, the fall makes us think within ourselves that someone else cares about you. Nobody's looking at you. <laughs> and what I do now, what I do now, I'm just trying to help since we're on this. What I do now, uh, when, I, when it's time to worship the Lord, I think of all of the things that he's helped me, that he's blessed me, that he's not only saved me, he has so many times delivered me. He has so many times been so, so good to me that I just want to tell him thank you. And if it means that I lift my hands, I don't have a problem with that. If it means sometimes hot tears are running out of my eyes, I, I don't care. Because somebody else might see you. I don't care because they didn't save me. He saved me, and I want him to know I thank you. And so this is something that we learn, it's part of sanctification, that we learn how to openly uh, worship the Lord, not just with a hand clap, but with our voices, with our physical expression, that we learn how to openly worship him. Because as I said, worship is going to be happening in heaven. Um, and if you make it, you certainly want to be joining into that worship. Amen? Okay, I'll get back on the Bible class. They fell before the throne on their faces and they worshiped God, saying, this is the, the words of their worship, amen, truly. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Now, no doubt that's not the only thing that's contained within the worship, but that's the, the, the sense of it is that they're just, they're just worshiping the Lord for his goodness. <clears throat> and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? Now, these, this is the number of people that got saved. Uh, and whence came they? And John said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, I want to draw, these are they. He's talking about 
this group of people, which verse 9 said was a great multitude. It wasn't 1,000 or 1,500. It was a great multitude. It was global from every, which no man, oh, there it is, a great multitude which no man could number. So we're talking probably millions. Uh, millions. It wouldn't be an easy head count. Of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, that means it is a global uh, effort, this evangelism. And it means that as people come to Christ, to a large extent, they lose their lives. They are martyred for Jesus Christ. This, this is why you want to get right with God now. I mean, it's wonderful that people get saved during the tribulation, but being saved just prior to the rapture is better. <laughs> it's much better. And so we know that these people are killed during the tribulation because it's a great multitude. That many people don't die in a week. And so people are, are dying for their faith. And remember, the Antichrist now is moving into, uh, into a position of power. And one of his uh, achievements, one of his goals is going to be, number one, to eliminate Israel. But number two, to eliminate anyone who does not call on him as their God. These are they which came out of great tribulation. Oh, God but they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. And that's symbolic. It just simply means that their sully, sinful garments that they had uh, from their sinful lifestyles, they've washed them in the blood. They've come to Jesus Christ and the, the blood has washed away all the sins and now they have on the pure white robes indicative of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Therefore, now, now catch this. Therefore, it's important. Let me go back. These are they which come out of great tribulation. Here's what they did. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, because of that, are they before the throne of God. And serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth upon the throne shall dwell among them. In other words, there's one way to get to heaven, and it is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Just coming to church, bless you, that's good. You can, get, you can learn, you can be influenced by uh, the message, that's wonderful. But every single human being has to have a personal experience with Jesus Christ, just you and him. In other words, one person doesn't get in because his mama got in. One person doesn't get in because, well, my spouse got in. That, yeah, we're married. We're, we're a pair. We move together. No, no, no. Every single person has a personal responsibility to get right, have a come to Jesus moment in which you are introduced to Jesus Christ, not just as Savior, but as Lord. That means he takes control of your life. That means that he tells you how to think, how to talk how to act. And you'll know when you have that relationship because all of a sudden you'll say a word and you'll realize, ooh, that wasn't right. Has anybody, that ever happened to anybody? Or you'll express an attitude and you'll realize, oh, man, I, that wasn't good. I feel bad about what I said. That's, that's what salvation is. Verse 16. Oh, this is good. They shall hunger no more. Now, this is talking about the innumerable number, but it's talking about all uh, re the full redeemed church of the living God. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Now, I, I read after several commentaries, and most commentaries won't touch this first phrase at all. They just won't touch it. They jump straight to neither shall the sun light on them, and they'll reference another scripture. But of the commentators that will speak on this, all of them it is a consensus. It means that people who are, who are saved, who are in heaven, will no longer have the need to eat food and will no longer have the need to drink fluid. Now, let me tell you how that is. And why I think that's right. 
When you eat now, it is so that your natural body can get nutrition, nourishment, so it can perpetuate itself. When you drink, it's for the benefit of your natural body. It does nothing for your spirit, man. If it did something for your spirit, man, all of us could go overeat and we'd be spiritual giants. It does nothing for your spiritual, man. It only blesses your natural body. When you are in heaven, you don't have a natural body. You've taken it off. You now have a spiritual body. And the spiritual body does not need natural food. It needs spiritual food. So once we have a body like unto Jesus' glorified body, we don't have a necessity to eat, but rather our nourishment comes straight from Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? I, I know some of you are good, you know, you're, you're eaters. You like to eat. You know, that, it's amazing. Some people just like the taste of different foods. You know, they're, they're very keen on what tastes like this and what tastes like that. I'm not a big eater, so I don't care. If I don't have to take time to cook stuff and I can just keep doing what I'm doing, that's wonderful. So they shall hunger no more, neither thirst anymore, neither shall the sun light on them. Now, this is a, a, a reference, I believe it's in Isaiah, uh, but I want to share with you what, what is in Revelation 21, chapter 21, if you'll flip there, verse 23. This is when the New Jerusalem comes down to the planet of course, God will be moving heaven to this earth. This earth will become heaven. New Jerusalem, which is the golden city, will come down from God out of the sky. Um, and we'll, we'll cover that when we get to it. But we will dwell in this New Jerusalem. It's a city that's made out of gold of such a quality, the gold is transparent. That's where we will live. And there will be the river of life will flow through the city with the trees of life on either side of the river. But of course, the trees of life are for people who lived through the tribulation who are, don't have glorified bodies. The human race will continue like it is now, only without, not with the sin. And so the trees of life are needed for the human race to perpetuate itself and not, not die after 70 or 80 years. Those of us that have glorified bodies, we are immortal. We, we won't have to eat the trees of life. We're immortal. That's what salvation is, eternal life. So then this scripture says concerning the sun, and it's talking again about the new Jerusalem in verse 23. It says, and that city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine on it, because the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So that means that we, everything we need now, incidentally, if the sun wasn't up there, you would die. You need vitamin D, you need light, you would, you would not survive if there was not a sun. This says that that will no longer be the source of our being able to live but Jesus Christ himself, everything that we need comes directly from him. Man, that's, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. Verse 17. Let me back up and read into it. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat, because, because, the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. There it is. And shall lead them to living fountains of water. Now, again, we look at this phrase, living fountains of water. We know that this is spiritual because even now the scripture says, he that believes on Jesus Christ out of his belly flows Rivers of living water. So we know that's something spiritual. It doesn't mean we have water flowing out of our, out of, it's not natural. And this as well is not natural. It is spiritual. And God shall wipe all tears from their eyes. Praise the Lord. I, I don't think there's a, a person that, unless they die as a little bitty baby, and even then, that lives long on this planet that doesn't cry. <laughs> we were never meant to. Now, God did not create Adam to cry. 
But because of sin, we weep often because we're hurt. We're hurt internally. We're hurt in one way or another. But God's great plan of redemption is, I'm going to wipe away every tear. I'm going to put a smile on every face. Isn't that wonderful? And you know, sometimes it's not outside things. It's not external things. Sometimes I find myself, I'm crying because of what I am. Because I'm not happy with what I am. And this is the best I've been since I've been on the planet. <laughs> and it's still, uh, it's still a, a, a source of frustration for me. I wish, I wish I could be, just be more like him. But I'm in the process. But he says, I'm going to wipe away every tear. Mm. I'm going to give you a white stone with a new name in it. And we'll tell you what that means when we get to that chapter. Okay, chapter 8. So then, as I said earlier, chapter 7 is parenthetical. It is a, a side issue. John gives us a quick glimpse of the events that are happening uh, in heaven between the 6th and the seventh seal. And remember the sixth seal, uh, God had just shook the whole universe and he's captured the attention of the, entire, of the entire planet. Now it says, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, we just read all of this worship is going on. You, you, you got the living creatures, you got the 24 elders, you got the angels, you got the redeemed uh, saints, all of them, they're just worshiping the Lord. And then all of a sudden, heaven is silent. And it's a reverence and an awe and a fear realizing that God is about to take his great power to himself and his judgment is about to fall. God is referred to as the Mysterium Tremendum. Uh, I, think that's, I, I think that's Latin. But what it means is that he is the mystery that, that pulls you to him. You just want to know more about him. You just want to look more into it. But at the same time, there's a terror about him. There's something it's, it's like looking into a black hole. He's so attractive. He's so loving. He's, he's all of this, but there's also a sense of awe and terror in his presence. And so heaven is silent for the space of half an hour as all stand in awe and silence. I, I, I have five siblings, and we all got in trouble a lot when we were growing up. We got group whoopings. <laughs> but whenever one of us was getting a whooping, all the rest of us were silent. So this is what I think of in this moment when heaven is just silent in awe, in fear, in reverence of what God is about to do. And John says, I saw the seven angels who stood before God. And to them was given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints unto the golden altar, which was before the throne. Now, you have to be familiar with the tabernacle and the accoutrements of the tabernacle to kind of understand what, what is happening here. When you walked into the tabernacle in the days of Moses, and of course the temple was pretty much built on the same, the same pattern, uh, there was only one door to get in. When it was covered by a linen uh, uh, fence, and it had only one way in, the door. Jesus said, I am the door. And when you walk through the door, the first thing you saw, you had to deal with it. It was the brazen altar. This is where the sacrifice was sacrificed. This is where the lamb was burnt. And it's a type of when you come into Christianity, the first thing you have to deal with is Jesus Christ. You can't get past it. You have to deal with it. So then anyway, when you walk into the holy place, 
there were some furnishings there. Straight ahead of you would have been the, uh, the golden altar or the altar of the incense. On one side would be the table of showbread, and on the other side would be the golden candlestick. And so what is being talked about here uh, is the, the altar of worship. It's a place where incense were, were burned. It represents the mediatorial role of Jesus Christ. But we see that in heaven there is the actual, uh, the, the actual altar in heaven. What Moses had was a type of what was already in heaven. So it says, there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Which means that every time you and I pray, pray, that prayer actually goes up to the golden altar and goes up before God. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. Now remember, the first angel said, don't hurt the earth, nor the trees, nor the seas. Here's the first thing is the earth. The four winds are no longer being held back. The first thing is this, uh, it's thrown into the earth. It's cast into the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And so let me give you the sense of what is happening here. <clears throat> uh, the sacrifice was always representative of Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And they had what was called the, the brazen altar. It was a large altar. It had a dirt embankment that you walked up. The fires under it would burn and they would take the little sheep, the lamb, the goat, whatever the sacrifice was and lay it on the fire and it would be consumed as a symbol of what would happen to Jesus on Calvary. And the, the lamb represented Jesus Christ in his death on the cross. The fires that consumed that little lamb, those were the, that represented the judgment of God. It, it represented the hot wrath of God against sin. And that sacrifice would be consumed as Jesus hung on the cross. His life was consumed by the anger of God against sin. Okay. So this altar now, this angel takes a coals from the altar and he throws them down to the earth. And here's what it means. It means since you did not want the benefit of the sacrifice, to take the hot wrath of God in your place, we are now going to throw the wrath of God on you directly. And that's the reality. That's reality for every person. Either Jesus is your sacrifice. He takes the wrath for you, meaning that you accept him not only as Savior, but as well you accept him as your Lord and your King and your God. And when that is done, it will change your life. I, I was talking to my wife and telling, you know, a lot of people just have an ad on Jesus. You know how you can buy a piece of software and you just get buy an ad on, just add it on to what you already got. And we try to add Jesus into the life that we already have, but that's not how he rolls. When he comes in, he takes over everything. He moves you in a direction that you would not have gone by yourself. And through the Holy Spirit, he's there every day correcting you. Letting you, he's merciful, he's kind, he's long-suffering, but he's corrective. And he, he works in us to, to make us better versions, to make us more Christ-like. And so the, the thought here then is that if a person does not want Jesus Christ as the lamb, as the savior, as the sacrifice, then they get the coals of the altar because there's, as Brother Swagger says, one thing standing between us and eternal hell, and it's the cross. Is Jesus Christ. The angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar. This altar is representative of the brazen altar where the sacrifice was burnt. And he cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Concerning these earthquakes, if you go back through the scripture, whenever God is going to do a... a Tremendous thing. There is an earthquake. 
You can go all the way back to Moses. When God came down on Sinai, there was an earthquake. When Jesus hung on the cross and he gave up the ghost, there was an earthquake. When he was resurrected three days later, there was an earthquake. So earthquakes are indicative of God getting ready to, not every earthquake that happens, but when he's about to do something, many times it's uh, accompanied by an earthquake, and we see that here. As a matter of fact, this phrase, there was thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake, that's the exact same thing that happened when God came down on Mount Sinai uh, while the Israelites were in the, in the wilderness. Thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. I have run out of time. I am enjoying this. So we're going to stop right here because this is the first trumpet blast. And remember, the seals, for the most part, except for the sixth uh, and seventh seal, the first five are really somewhat man's inhumanity to man. The trumpets are the, uh, a blast of warning. It's a warning. It's a shot across the bow. You need to get it right because the bowls are coming. And then, of course, the bowls are or the actual death blow. So we'll stop right here with verse 6, and we'll pick up next week. I appreciate your time and your attention tonight. Brother Ike, would you close this, please? Thank you, Pastor. Amen. You know, the thing about uh, Revelations is that it's pretty clear that we serve a great God. And um, it just kind of reminds me that, you know, he's not on, well, I'm not on, put it this way, he's not on my side, but I need to be on his side because, um, you know, just reading through this, yeah, it's kind of mind-blowing. So with that being said, if you haven't given, please go ahead and get ready to do so now. As you guys know, there are several ways to give. And once again, thank you for your help on the TV um, ad. We have reached the goal. And um, I think we saw it on Sunday that the ad will be playing on several major um, networks. Yeah. Amen. So with that being said, please rise and I will close us out with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you because you are great. And um, we don't even know what that, what that word means, Father, because you are more than great. But we love you and we thank you because you sent your son and we have a chance to be on your side. Father, help us to walk in the truth. Help us to walk in the light. Help us to do the work while it's still light, Lord, because a day is coming when it's dark and no man can work. So, Father, we just say, Father, just help us to be mindful of the time. Help us to press into everything you have for us, Lord, and just help us to know that you, that you are with us in all that we do. We love you. We thank you, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. You're dismissed. See you guys on Sunday.